Hi everyone, my name is Donna Gans. I'm the National Lymphoma Nurse Director with Lymphoma Australia and I'm joined today by Professor Judith Chopman from Concord Hospital in Sydney. Uh, welcome Judith. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this uh, uh, week, we've um, Australia, Lymphoma Australia were to be at um, EHA, the European um, Conference uh, for Hematology, but unfortunately, due to COVID, we're all in Australia and across Australia. That's okay. We've, um, we're still coming to you and with all the highlights from all the experts around Australia um, and reporting back to all the highlights with that. So um, Judith, th thanks for joining us today. Um, you're going to be talking a little bit about one of the um, studies that interested you. Yeah. Is that a this is a study that's been a, a real privilege to be a part of Donna over the past um, four, four years or so. And uh, this is the very initial uh, first in human phase one, then phase two clinical trial of Zanubrutinib. Uh, the very potent, uh, very selective uh, Brutin tyrosin kinase inhibitor. And um, just to let you know that Brutin tyrosin kinase is um, an, a very a critical enzyme uh, for the survival and maturation and proliferation of, of B lymphocytes. And Zanubrutinib uh, is sort of the next generation uh, inhibitor from uh, the original inhibitor of Brutinib. Uh, which is shown to be very effective across many indolent uh, B cell lymphomas like uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, like uh, mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, and of course chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma. And so in this all comers trial, we, we demonstrated um, the uh, tremendous uh, safety uh, and efficacy of xanabrutinib across many of these uh, diseases. And it's, it's, it's fair to say that we very quickly got a clear picture that because xanabrutinib was such a, a selective inhibitor of this, this one enzyme with very little off-target effect, um, we were seeing fewer side effects compared to the first generation brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, abrutinib. And what we presented at, at ASCO and at the European Hematology Association meeting was the results from this uh, first trial and also the results from the uh, randomized control trial that uh, was led by Beijing and with our own CONTAM down at Peter McCallum Cancer Center comparing abrutinib with xanabrutinib in WM. Now, the key uh, reason why we, I really want to present the phase one data on xanabrutinib in WM is because we've got a really large cohort of 77 patients and we've got long-term follow-up or longer-term follow-up, at least uh, three years of follow-up in this patient population compared to only one and a half years, much earlier follow-up uh, from the phase three study. So there's a lot of extra information that, that we've learned from, from this study. And I think that the first thing uh, to uh, make clear is that 96% of patients with Waldenstrom's uh, had a uh, response uh, to Xanabrutinib. So it's a, a very high response rate. Uh, and while the numbers are small uh, across different genotypes uh, in terms of uh, the genetic features of patients with Waldenstrom's, uh, the, there does appear to be a, a very good response uh, to xanabrutinib, regardless of what genotype uh, you have. Now, the important thing is, is that there's an overall response rate of about uh, 96% after, after three years of, of follow-up. And the very good partial response, which is a reduction in the IgM level as a, as a measure, as a marker of the disease, uh, that IgM level has got to have reduced by 90% or come down to, to normal uh, to achieve a very good partial response. And that rate uh, was 45%. So almost half the patients were getting a very good partial response. And as a, as a, as a result of that, uh, not only did we see that the response rates were very high, we saw that the response rates increased over time. 
And uh, while originally, you know, in the first uh, year of follow-up, uh, we might have only had um, about a, um, about, uh, I think it was all patients, was about uh, a 30% uh, very good partial response rate. By the time we got to three years of follow-up, we had about 45% of them having a very good partial response rate. So, you know, it takes time to get uh, these uh, really top-notch responses in a lot of patients. And I'm seeing that even in patients who've been on Xanabrutinib uh, for four years, they're still, uh, IgMs are still slowly uh, trickling down. Uh, what's really uh, reassuring is that another measure of uh, response is the haemoglobin level um, because most patients uh, with uh, very high IgM levels, most patients with Waldenstrom's are very fatigued by their anemia. And we uh, saw a very rapid climb in the haemoglobin in these patients, uh, generally sort of going up from an average of about 100 grams uh, per litre up to, you know, 130, 140 grams per litre uh, very quickly. And uh, so that was also very gratifying. And in some ways, I, I just I so wish that uh, Beijing, the study sponsor, the people who make the Xanabrutinib, had done some quality of life surveys in the study so mm -hmm. we could have captured um, how well the patients were feeling because I could see uh, their haemoglobins coming up and their IgMs dropping uh, very quickly week by week in, in clinic and it was incredibly uh, gratifying and a, and a privilege, real privilege to, to treat patients with this BTK inhibitor. Mm -hmm. uh, so another measure of uh, demonstrating response is this term called progression-free survival. And progression-free survival is demonstrating that the IgM hasn't gone up again or the patient hasn't died. So progression of the disease and death are the two endpoints that are included in that progression-free survival figure. And we were really delighted to note that with you know, with a median three years of follow-up, that the progression-free survival uh, remained um, really quite high at sort of around the, um, I think it was about the 80% mark uh, in this patient population. And so that, that was also extremely uh, gratifying. And then the other important thing is that because patients with Waldenstrom's have a lot of adverse events, in particular a lot of infections, and they also uh, do often get second uh, cancers. And in this initial study, because it was an early study, anyone who got a second cancer had to go off the Xanabrutinib uh, to the angst of a few of my patients with you know, prostate cancer or other cancers that were easily treated um, and were not going to threaten their, their life in the same way that their symptomatic Waldenstrom's was. Um, there was actually 13% of patients who discontinued the Xanabrutinib treatment in that three-year period because of these adverse events. Um, but very few patients actually discontinued because of an adverse toxicity because of the Xanabrutinib, because it is, is tolerated uh, extremely well. And uh, there was certainly no one who, who died because of being on uh, Xanabrutinib. Mm. Um, the, the classic side effects of uh, Ibrutinib uh, and the brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors as, as, a, uh, as a drug class are bruising and bleeding, uh, which is inconvenient and not pleasant for the patient to, to see. It's not, um, you know, it's a quite disfiguring to have your, you know, forearms all covered and your hands all covered with, with bruises. Um, we saw uh, quite a, a low rate of, of bruising. Um, and although we recorded at least 30 odd percent of patients who had bruising, I think we were watching out for it so very carefully because of the abrusion of story. And I was a, you know, a recruiter and investigator in the Innovate study and used a lot of abrusion in WM and certainly didn't see the same amount of bruising. All the bruising uh, that we saw in that you know, 30, 35% of patients was virtually always grade one. All right, very, very low rates of, of um, more serious bruising. Uh, and likewise, we had a very low rate. Uh, I think it was only about uh, one or two patients 
who got atrial fibrillation, who got the irregular uh, beating of their, their heart collecting chambers uh, that needed them to be on, on blood thinning treatments or treatments to slow down the rate of their, their heart rate. Uh, so, so that was um, very encouraging because we know that uh, atrial fibrillation is, is a known um, toxicity of these brute and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the other thing that's really important with prolonged follow-up is hypertension, high blood pressure, which we all recognize is becomes quite common for patients on ibrutinib. And even early in the Aspen study, we saw a difference in the rates of hypertension. And in the long-term follow-up that we get from this study, we see that the hypertension rates were, were very low, you know, about 15%. Um, after three years, and most of that was only very mild hypertension. So, so that was really reassuring too. And then the one uh, last uh, side effect I'd like to talk about is diarrhea. You know, diarrhea is quite you know socially disabling for patients when they're having bowel motions three times a day, um, and I would see that occasionally with patients on on ibrutinib, and that's where I saw just. I just didn't see any diarrhea, and there's uh, very little reporting of diarrhea on, on the Zanabrutinib. So I think we do have, um, as is now evidenced uh, by the Aspen data, um, we've got long-term follow-up of 77 patients on our early phase study, and then we've got uh, you know, uh, short-term follow-up from the Aspen study, that really shows Xanobrutinib is, you know, a really, really uh, valuable brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor for the treatment of, of Waldenstrom's. And so, you know, I do hope that, that one day we will be able to offer this on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme for, for patients uh, in Australia to, to treat their WM. Indeed. Thank you, Jude. That means that that's a fantastic... Um a uh, side effect profile for patients and um, they, again quality of life is very important especially for these patients that live with this disease for many many years so hopefully we do see it on the PBS eventually so I think, I think that's another important thing you're talking about living with the disease for many years and that's to remember that all these beta inhibitors are effectively just a switch yeah. a switch off the activity of the Waldstroms all right there very few of them get a complete response. Um, it's not a cure. It's it's got to be continued to be taken every day for it to yes, I love to. Day, um, for it to be um, to be effective. And so, you know, we are very keen in Australia to participate in studies where we can combine uh, the brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, because of brutin of two is, is a great treatment for Waldenstrom's. Uh, we can combine the beta can inhibitor along with an antibody against CD20, which is also expressed on the Waldenstrom cells, and uh, potentially also an agent such as venetoclax, um, to try and see whether we can get people into deep and prolonged remissions and potentially get them on a sort of a treatment-free you know, pathway of eating. Yeah, that's a very good point because you don't chemo free, <laughs> chemo free and treatment free for as long as possible as well. Well, thank you so much. There's a lot of good promise coming from that drug. It's very exciting for patients, that's for sure. And hopefully, more trials will be coming our way soon. Thank you. Thank you.